Hello there, I'm Alger Hill, and this is a book review of Oathbringer by Brandon Sanderson. Oathbringer came out about a month ago now, and I've been a little slow in reading this because it is beastly. Look at this book. Reading a Sanderson book, you're like, oh, I got a thousand pages in. Oh, that's pretty good. I wonder how close, and you still have 30% left. It's a very long book, but it is an excellent book, and I'm here to talk about it today. A slight addendum, if you've just found my channel from this video, this is normally a gaming Let's Play channel. I will be making another channel for book reviews if these kind of books, if these videos do well. So if you do like it, can you give me a like and a comment and let me know what you think? Because, you know, I want to know how it's going. If you guys think it's cool, I will do more of them because I really enjoy them and I read a lot. A lot. Uh, Tor Books were kind enough to offer me a review copy. Now this book, this book is the most well-traveled book in the world, okay? I'm just going to show you something. This is the packaging. This is the packaging right here. I'm going to cover up my address. The packaging that it shipped from New York to London, then from London to Melbourne, Melbourne to Sydney, Sydney to Melbourne, and then Melbourne to Brisbane, where I am currently residing. I will be moving back to the UK next month, but this book traveled a long way. The packaging is destroyed, but it has survived. It is covered in marks saying no number, return to sender, and all kinds of stuff due to some people who helped ship it for me and made a few mistakes along the way. But it's finally here, and I had a good chance to read it, and I finished it a little while ago. Wow. Oathbringer is the third installment of the Stormlight Archive, one of the, or rather the series of Brandon Sanderson. Sanderson is a very prolific fantasy author who is known at the moment as the guy who is the Stephen King of fantasy, despite the fact that Stephen King already has written a 10 book series or something on fantasy. Sanderson writes like a beast. It is not unheard of for him to do a book every year, if not two books a year. This guy's insane. It is crazy. Other authors cannot be compared to him. One of the top posts on the subreddit dedicated to the King Killer Chronicles, another great book series by Patrick Ruffus, is basically saying, please calm down. Do not compare his writing style to Sanderson's. Sanderson is something else entirely. We can't compare. The speed with which this man writes is ridiculous. He has published a variety of books, um, all within the same universe, the Cosmere universe, which is where Stormlight takes place. And Stormlight is meant to be his kind of magnum opus. He's planning it to take ten books, and this is book three. Book one only came out a few years ago, but this guy's been churning them out. He's been doing a lot of work. This is when things start to get really serious in the Stormlight Archive. I'm going to be doing this review in two ways. I'm going to be first talking about the book generally, without any kind of spoilers, my kind of take on it, what I thought about it, some really interesting things that aren't too spoilery, and a general consensus on the video. Then I'll be going into spoilers. If you do not want spoilers and you're trying to decide whether or not you want to read this book, that's why you're watching me, hopefully, don't watch that part because it will ruin some things that would destroy the book for you. There are not a lot of books out there, I think, that contain a lot of powerful moments that make you stand up. Things do happen when you have, you know, big, oh wow, it was the butler all along, and that's fair, that's fine, but they're not that interesting. Oathbringer has, honestly, a couple moments. One big one, but honestly a few moments that really make you just stand. I stood up in a campground in Sydney. I stood up physically with my mouth open in shock at one of the moments, which I will, so I will talk about it, but if you don't want to be spoiled, don't watch that section. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Stormlight is. It is, the planet's called Roshar, and a little bit about the magic system for those who aren't aware. I mean, it's the third book in the series. Really read the first one. It's really good. So, Storms come all the time. All the society is built around the fact that there are storms that come from the east around every 11 or 14 days or so, and they just destroy everything. You have to be inside to survive it. It's just a part of life, and life also is very, very um, evolved towards that. Even animals, like there's no birds. There's like things that have like carapaces. It's a very tough world. It's a strong world. A tenacious people live on this planet, okay? But it's also a planet beset by myriad apocalypses. Apocalypses happen a lot. So there's a world beset by apocalypses that manages to recover, and that's kind of where we are, thousands of years after the last um, desolation, which is the name of the apocalypses. And a lot of things are happening. There is a new species, they're called Voidbringers, that were talked about in the last books. There are gods, there are angels, you could say, called the Knights. Well, hmm, heralds are kind of angels in a sense. Think of them more like kind of like what the Ishtar might be in the Lord of the Rings, like Gandalf, they're like, they're kind of really powerful, they're not gods. Uh, and the Knights Radiant, kind of like a tier below them, and then like the normal plebs. 
and people are getting powers, and it, the Knight's Radiant has been refounded. People are getting their abilities back that have been gone from Roshar for about 4,000 years, and they all use powers linked to surges, and there are, I don't remember how many surges, but there are so many orders, and each order has two powers, sharing powers with orders next to them. So, that was a little brief overview. It's a, little, it's a very complicated book series, and Ms. Anderson's books, if you describe them, it's very difficult. When you talk about them, it feels like you're just kind of rambling nonsense. But when you read it, you, it's very character-driven, very personality-driven. When you read it, that's when you really start to understand it, and it becomes something about, about emotional journeys and depths. A big part about Roshar, again, not talking too much about Cosmere, um, but basically every planet, generally with humans on it mostly, has some kind of aspect of the of God, and the aspects that are on Rush are honor and cultivation. So life is very much built around the concept of honor, and the magic system is inherently tied to that. You have to say your well, not vows. You have to say the oaths. So I mean, they're the words of radiance is the the first oath, and every order has these oaths you have to say to gain your powers. You tie them to a spirit called a spren that essentially allows you to have those powers in exchange for being bound to a particular type of oaths. God, this gets complicated when you start talking about it like this. But gist of it is, oaths are very, very important. And that's kind of the theme of Stormlight. The value of an oath versus, versus well, it's, it's interesting. The idea of honor and an oath might actually clash, but that's kind of a contrasting idea. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, first of all, the before spoiler bits, let's talk about the, some of the characters. Um, they're going to be talking about the characters, I'm not going to spoil too much about them. what happens in this book, but I will spoil previous books a little bit. We have Kaladin. Kaladin is a man beset by grief and beset by genuine clinical depression. I think that's basically the idea. He genuinely goes into depression. And Kaladin is definitely my favorite character of this book series. He is a man who's seen death, who's seen everyone around him die, and for no reason that he can fathom, he keeps surviving. And the reason is because of the spren that's attached to him still. And he's one of the first knights ready to come back. And he basically... He goes through a lot of stuff, man. Okay? His character, I think, is fantastic. And there's lots of things that happens to him in Oathbringer that really expand the character and talk a lot about what it is to be depressed. And what I find so interesting about that is this is a fantasy book with magic and spirits and, like, turning stuff into other stuff. And honestly, without, like, being on the nose about it, it talks about depression. And it talks about what it is to be depressed. And how it feels to be, to have a, to wake up one every day and not be sure how you're going to feel that day. Whether this is a day where you're going to be depressed or if it's a day where you're going to be great. Or at least, you know, enough to get out of bed. And that's really interesting. I think that's a real powerful tool that Sanderson has brought into this book, that he's actually talking about such an important, interesting concept that I don't really think I've read much about, in, in, in not even just in fantasy, but in general, in books, which is so interesting about it. Okay, the crickets just started, or whatever that noise is, I'm just going to keep going, whatever. Uh, an important character to mention, I think, is Dalinar. Dalinar is a man forced to take control of not just the kingdom, but essentially the world, and also be embracing the order, or rather the responsibility, of the entirety of the world. But he's also a man who has a lot of tough choices to make and rectify them within his own past. Dalinar has not done some great things. He is known as the Blackthorn, the man who has caused so much death. A big part of the pre-Radiant world, or rather I guess say the first book and yeah, before, is that people do have access to a certain blades, shard blades. And these blades, when they cut, they don't cut through human flesh, they just go through it, and then it dies. They go through a living or an organ, the organ dies. Cut through someone's neck, their eyes burn out and die on the spot. You can just carve your way through armies. They also have shard plate that's immune to any other, well not immune, but it's incredibly difficult to to break through, and it almost has like a hit point system. It's a fantastic way of changing like the, the realm of battle, and it essentially changes battle tactics entirely. For example, um, the spear is the only real weapon that's useful in that kind of conflict. Swords are reserved for higher up tier people. Um, because what's the point of a sword if it's not a shard blade, right? And now there's a bird outside. Oh, that's just perfect. I'm going to keep going. Doesn't matter. Now, it's hard to talk a lot about the, the choices the characters make in the books without talking about the, the spoilers. But I will just give a very brief overview of the things I love and the things I hate, just to give you an immediate brief overview. 
things I love. Kaladin's deep emotional journey. Kaladin's feeling of an all-encompassing, crushing depression that he is struggling to beat in the face of all powerful odds. Dalinar, learning the truth about something that I'm not going to talk about, and I really want to until the spoiler section, I'll have to wait. Um, and also trying to be a better man. Getting to see the Shades Mirror, which is essentially the where all the Spren live and is kind of like the cognitive realm. Getting to see a whole different realm. It's also starting to tie in the Cosmere universe. We're learning a lot about the Cosmere, which is fantastic. Previously, things about the Cosmere are kind of Lightnings in the books, the, the different books that talk about different areas of the Cosmere, like Elantris and Mistborn, they're isolated to just their own worlds, and you get little hints of um, other worlds, but this is the first time we're actually getting to properly see a lot of different people. For example, in this, in Oathbringer, we have, again, it's a spoiler, but we have a character from Warbreaker, a different novel. Uh, of course, we have Hoyd, and I'll talk about Hoyd later on. Hoyd is a character that's in every single Cosmere novel. He's a world hopper. Um, we get some character in the previous book. We got a lot of different characters. We got characters from Elantris. Um, there's hints that it could be a character from Mistborn in this series as well. Um, we think people think it's you know it's still hypothesizing in the moment. Not everything's 100 percent certain. Getting to learn more about the overall stakes of Stormlight Archive and what they mean in the Cosmere scale. We're learning more about gods. We're learning more about the realities around the Cosmere and the effects the things that happen in one world can have on another, which is really interesting and it changes the stakes hugely. And also Lopin. I love Lopin so much. He is my spirit animal. Lopin is a fantastic character. The only thing I can say to Lopin is journey before pancakes, my friends. Things I did not like. There are things I did not like about Oathbringer. I would rate Oathbringer to be an excellent book. It is a, it is a piece of literature that I think any fantasy head should read. Fantasy head? Is that a thing? You know, where like you like fantasy. A fantasy person who reads fantasy, you should read Stormlight Archive. This is a beautiful piece of literature. It is fantastic. But it is also filled with some real chest. One thing I hate that is not a bad quality about the book is a very certain character that I'm not going to say his name, but you'll read it and you'll know exactly who I'm talking about. There's a whole subreddit that's decently big that is about how much they hate this character, I hate him and what he does. Now a couple things that I didn't like about the book that were Sanderson's writing style and the overall way the plot went. Um, this is going to sound a little controversial and I know it's going to sound a little stupid and I don't want to offend people, but I don't, it's not feminism. It's not a feminist thing. Because obviously there's always going to be these kind of feminist overtones with, with, um, especially, with especially these kind of medieval era books. Because obviously it's based on human medieval eras wherein women had a very terrible position in society and were essentially bargaining tools. And very few women in medieval history ever had a chance to make real impact. But in Stormlight Archive, or at least in the Elector culture, which is where the majority of the action takes place, um, get more comfortable, um, women are kind of don't really, women are actually allowed to be like scouts, they're allowed to join the military, and in fact women are the scribes of armies, because men aren't allowed, well, not allowed to read, but it's not socially and culturally accepted to read. So, for men anyway, so women do all the reading, all writing is done by women, so they have that very unique place in their society, but again, obviously there's limitations, like uh, women eat sweet food and men eat spicy food, that kind of stuff, it's quite a basic Tier, but it's just trying to create some distinction between classes, well, gender gender classes, because classism is a kind of general tone throughout this, especially when you're in Kaladin's perspective. He's very much focused about the class strife and the conflict between light eyes and dark eyes, who are the kind of like the tier system of society, of the light eyes and the dark eyes, which is crumbling with the advent of the Knight's Radiant, because by becoming a radiant, you become a light eyes, thus you lose that kind of distinction. So there's a couple characters, um, I would say, that are the women characters who are created because there need to be women characters in literature. Now, I'm not saying that that is a fact, a hard fact, but it is kind of true that if you're writing an all-encompassing fantasy epic, to not include women would just be a disservice to humanity because men and women, you know, are in equal portions of the population, so why are there not women as well, right? But the problem is, I don't think Sanderson knows how to write women. And that's my problem with women in his, in, at least in this series. Um, other 
series by S. Anderson, I think he does women very well. Um, I think in Mistborn, I think the main character, who is a woman, uh, rather really more of a young, um, a young adult, really, she actually is quite a decent character, but the thing is, is that that wasn't really about her being a woman, that was more about her being a girl becoming into a woman, which is easier to write, I think, because it's the same kind of teenage strife, and also had that kind of classism issue. And you could kind of talk about it through that, and it could be an everyman. And she was the uh, the Stephen Matron. Uh, there's another Stephen Mat, uh, you know, like the person you introduce things to, like so there can be a poor. I, cannot, I know there's an official term for this, but if you've ever read the Master and Commander series, the Aubrey Matron series, Stephen Matron is always the person who'd be like, "Oh, what's a sail?" And then everyone could be like, "Oh, you silly person! Here's a complicated sailing term explained in simplistic terms so the reader can understand." So everything was explained to her in this simplistic way, so as to not confuse the reader, which is a good technique. It's used all the time. Hey, the cricket gets stopped. Nice. The Shallon is the main female within the Stormlight Archive, and she's just terrible. She's the worst. I just cannot get into how much I hate her. I don't care. I just don't care about you, Shallon. You're so terrible. I don't care what you think how, how Adeline is handsome as sin. I don't care about how, oh, Kaladin's rugged jawline and his deep eyes. And I don't care about her, like, emotional crises that she's having. Granted, I think it's very cool that we're the main character is quite, she's quite literally a bit of a psychopath. She has some smooth, psychopath strong. She has some serious problems mentally. She killed her parents, man. She murdered them. Like, flat out murdered them. One was kind of in self-defense. But she still murdered her parents. Oh god, that's a weird... Is that a cocoa bear? Is that a cocoa bear outside? Australia, get it together. Whatever, man. I'm just gonna keep going. But I just don't care. She's... And also, also, Sanderson has this, again, this problem, is that he can't make a woman interesting without making them witty. Wit is interesting. Wit is funny. Wit is humor. Wit is being able to come up with a fast retort... Uh, think on the spot and be innovative in your conversation, right? But in in Sanderson's world, at least in Stormlight, what is the is the quality of being able to insult people because the writer says you can? It feels cheap. Shallon is amazing because she can insult people because the writer says she can insult people. There's no reason for her to be able to be insulting. Like she doesn't have like some kind of history or background that like you know like there's a reason for someone. To, Kaladin is dark because of the qualities of his life, the things that happened to him that made him dark, that made his life dark. Shallon has had an equally dark life, but she just randomly is witty. And it's like, hur, 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 people like her for it. But it's not funny because it's annoying. And the things she says are stupid. The things she says aren't particularly funny. But I feel like Sanderson has sat at his writing desk and has thought, I need to make Shallon relatable and enjoyable to women. How can I do that? I'll make her funny. But why can't she just be interesting? Why can't she just be a person? She doesn't feel like a person. Kaladin, Dalinar, Lopin even, hell. Rock, Rock the Horn Eater. A, a man who quite clearly has been raised as a soldier, but is not allowed to be a soldier because of his culture, the kind of Polynesian-inspired culture. Fantastic character. One with depth. One with, we only skim the surface of, but we understand his motivations, and we understand why he says the things he says and does the things he does. Shallon is just irritating. She's a protagonist that exists to be a protagonist with breasts. And like, she's that kind of like, like Katniss type female protagonist, wherein she's quite gorgeous. She has long flowing red hair, a thin attractive body, and like people describe her as being basically hot as hell. But from her perspective, she's like, oh, I don't know, I'm just, why would anyone ever find me attractive? It's like her mind, like, it's like watching Harry Potter and looking at Hermione being like, oh, I don't know why anyone would ever want to date me. And it's, it's Emma Watson, you know, it's just irritating. The other main female in this book is Jasna, Jasna Colin, who is the daughter of the, of the dead king. She's terrible! I hate her so much! She's not interesting! She's just cold, aloof, and awesome. That's all she is. She's cold, aloof, witty, and awesome. There's nothing else to her. We actually get like three or two or three chapters from her perspective. We do get to see her thoughts and her, sh and her, um, 
her spread, that's the word, God, just, we get to see her thoughts, and she does, is just as dull. She's just as boring in her own perspectives. Like, you look from a different character's perspective, and you see the out, her on the outset. It's like in Song of Ice and Fire. Every, the only time you see, you mainly see Jamie from the perspective of other people. And then when you get Jamie's perspective, you start to see him for who he really is, and you realize he's having to go through a character arc and changing. There's none of that in Jasna. She's just awful. She's just amazing. She's the most beautiful woman in the world, it seems, from what literally everyone will describe. She can kill anyone with a thought and turn anything to anyone. She's had, she's, it appears she's sworn the most O's of anyone, which gives her access to ridiculous powers, by the way. She's just amazing. She's a fantastic person in every quality, and that's boring. No one, it's called a Mary Sue as a trope. You want to go on TV tropes, look up Mary Sue. It's not interesting to have a character with all-encompassing powers, with these amazing abilities that trump everyone, and there are arbitrary reasons why she's not able to use those abilities. And then when she does, she kills everyone. There's a scene which is amazing, that she destroys everyone around her and basically just wins the day. It's amazing, but it's not that interesting. It's not fun when Superman shows up and kills everyone, you know, beats everyone up and puts them in jail, because he could have done that at any time. Instead, it's this contrivance. It's making her not available. She's been not available for two books because she died, and she had to go to Shadesmere and work her way back, and everyone thought she was dead. So she spent the entirety of this book just, like, researching stuff. It's so dumb. And finally, the other thing I really don't like about this book is romance. There is a shoehorned in romance that has absolutely no place in Stormlight Archive. I know I shouldn't say that. In a 10 book epic, it should be allowed to have romantic things in it, right? But it should be interesting. It should contribute to the story. Romances that exist for no reason belong in crappy films released for Valentine's Day. They do not belong in fantasy epics. Sanderson, please. Okay, it's not that interesting. The romance that existed in Mistborn was just barely okay. Like, it was just kind of annoying, and it felt out of place, but it was alright because it was tied to characters. It was tied to who they were. It was tied to their progression as people and their reactions to things around them and holding, holding together a drift in a storm bound by circumstance. In Stormlight Archive, Shallon likes Adeline because Adeline is handsome. She gets to marry him because her big mama, Jasna, says, yeah, you can marry him. And then they just do, I guess, um, spoiler alert, and there's this whole, like, tr love triangle that doesn't exist between Shallon and Kaladin and Adeline. No stakes are ever raised. It's just, like, mentioned a couple times that Shallon likes Kaladin as well. Or rather, a perspective of Shallon, because she is quite clearly so schizophrenic and has multiple personalities, but let's not go into that. I just don't care. Maybe some people do, but I don't. I've been talking so long about Shallon and her romance that I actually had to clear out the space on my camera. That's right. Talking about the relationship, I expect that kind of relationship, that kind of nonsense in The Reckoners, which is like the Steelheart series, also by Sanderson. There's a kind of more children's, more young adult style fantasy, which I'm reading at the moment and look forward to a review of, of the three books. That's right, look forward to that on this channel. Make sure you subscribe to see that. I expect that in that series, not here. It doesn't have a place. It's shoehorned in and it's uninteresting and annoying. It's just, no, it's just, oh, I hate it so much. I just don't care. You're just storming hands. You're so storming hands of Adeline. I don't understand. You're just so cute. And you're, you're just so kind. You're the nicest person to everyone. Yeah, Kaladin's got a sexy jaw. I don't care. I just don't care. No one cares. Stop it. Please. Okay. <sighs> Deep breaths. Except for those little irritations, Oathbringer is a book that deserves to be on every single person's read list of 2017-18, because it came out in 2017. Not only is it a fantastic piece of literature, it also is filled with beautiful pieces of art. I will show you just a few examples right here. They are absolutely gorgeous. They kind of showcase some variety of beautiful artwork. Though I'm a little bit unclear of what exactly they are, because none of these are actually characters, which is strange. None of them are actually people in the books, um, but they're still there. For example, you have your maps of Elekthar. Sanderson works with a fantastic artist whose name escapes me at the moment, um, but his art is beautiful. And also, there are a couple times in the books where things happen which are very strange. Shallon draws them. That's her merit, at least, because she's a fantastic artist. And then you get to see things like this. Look at that. It's beautiful. 
fantastic artwork. It's really, it really brings something to the table, and I think it's the type of thing that makes literature more of an interactive experience by including drawings that are drawn in the book. A character draws something, and then you see the drawing. I think it's amazing, and I love having that in this novel, and I think it adds a huge quality to the book that I don't think other books really get a chance to do. It's a fantastic piece of literature, and I think everyone should read it, whether or not you are a Stormlight fan or a Cosmere fan, Sanderson fan, or fantasy fan, you should read it. It's a fantastic book. Now, I'm going to talk about some spoiler stuff. I'm going to be mentioning some stuff that will ruin the book and will make it so you will hate yourself if you watch this and you haven't read the book. If you have not read the book and you do not want it spoiled, stop now. Go away, go to the comment section, and I want you to write down in the comment section, I did not watch the spoilers because I want to read it for myself. I want to see that verbatim, right, right there. I want to see it, okay? Do not watch this pit. Watch the rest of the video. Do not watch this bit if you have not read the book, or at least you don't care about spoilers. Okay. Oh my god, Dalinar, you monster. Dalinar realizes why he can't hear the name of his wife. He has not been able to hear the name of his wife. He purged it from his memory. He went to a god. Essentially, it turned out to be cultivation. Small side note. We don't know where Cultivation is. In this book, we find out where she is, right? We don't know where Cultivation is. We know that Honor is dead. The god God is dead. Cultivation has been in hiding from the evil god, Odium, right? I know, long story. But he goes to the Night Mother, and she will basically give you power. She will basically give you something or help you in exchange for something. She'll curse you. She'll give you a blessing, and she'll give you a curse in turn. But he keeps asking Stormfather, was that cultivation. He's like, no, it was not cultivation. That was not cultivation. And then we find out, and then we finally get the memory of him doing it, and he goes to Night Mother, and then cultivation's like, yo, Night Mother, shut up. No, stop it. I'll take care of this. Night Mother, you go away. No, I'm cultivation. That's Night Mother. She's just my, you know, my apprentice. And she's literally just like, that's it. So it was, it was cultivation, and he was just lying to preserve the mystery. And that's not good writing. And I think that a lot of people, that's gonna slip by them. That's just cheap. It's really cheap that he did that because he's just trying to—he's trying to hide where night the cultivation is and kind of amp that mystery up. And then the reveal happens it's like, oh, it was right there. Okay, it's boring. It's just not interesting. Now he goes, and we know that he lost the ability to hear his wife's name and all that, and all the memories of her. We find the reason out, and the reason builds up over flashback chapters for the entirety of the book. Here, from this whole book, only just this, and then we find out like there. Okay. We find out what happened and the, near the end, almost, well, like the last quarter. He, in retribution for a myriad of, of wrongs, burned an entire city to the ground with burning oil, killing tens of thousands, slaughtering them when they tried to escape, burning the city, rolling barrels of pitch down a thing, down a, like a crevice that he thought the city was in like in a, it's called a rift inside the ground, like in a rift in the ground, right? And he thought that the royal family he was going to be killing was inside the place where the last time he was there when, where they were. And it turned out his wife was in there. He burned his wife to death by accident while slaughtering and committing a Holocaust level atrocity in this world. Literally the worst atrocity probably ever committed. This guy killed tens of thousands of people in retribution for, honestly, quite horrible things, but he killed so many innocents. When this happened, I stood up from where I was sitting. I was reading it in a campground kitchen while traveling from Melbourne all the way up to Brisbane. It was a two and a half week journey and I was reading the book. While I was reading it, I was in the kitchen, flicking through pages. My sausages were cooking on the campground barbecue. And I stood up with my mouth open and Olivia, my girlfriend next to me, goes, what, what's wrong, what's wrong? I just put my hand out, shh, I need to read this. And I just kept reading it for the next 10 minutes of the chapter, closed the book, and I just was silent. I just, I, and I just sat and I told her about the whole book because I do that. I talk a lot about things that I like and I bore her with it, as I'm doing to you right now, but you, you already watched this, so it's your fault. Your fault. Okay. It's really interesting to read an entire 1200, 1400 page book and then you get a chance to just talk about it for so long. I want to add more book reviews uh, to this channel. Um, obviously, this is a gaming let's play channel. Um, like I said at the beginning of the video, guys, leave me a like and a comment. Let me know if you like to see more like this. Um, obviously, this is a gaming let's play channel. Do subscribe to me. 
Uh, let me know if you like it and I will start doing more. Maybe make a separate channel. Uh, thank you so much for, to Tor Publishing for sending me Oathbringer all the way across the world. Um, I'm looking forward to doing more book reviews and I'd like to try and review every single Sanderson novel because I've read every single Sanderson novel except for The Reckoners that I'm currently working my way through. I would love to do this more and I really enjoy it. Please let me know what you think. Pick it up. This is a fantastic book, but it has some times where you're going to hate yourself and you're going to hate Sanderson and you're going to hate the world and hate a certain character. But it's a, definitely a worthwhile read that's going to have you not really able to sleep because you keep wanting to read it at night. And your girlfriend is kind of kicking you in the leg saying, please go to sleep. I have to get up in the morning, but you want to read what happens to Kaladin. I was Alger Hill, and I'll continue to be. And this has been my review of Oathbringer by Brandon Sanderson. Thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.